There were a lot of robberies committed when Frank Garden was on the roads, so many so that it was impossible for him to do them all because John Peasley will even go to the trouble of writing to the newspaper and saying that he couldn't commit all the crimes they accused him of either. This old chap writes his memoirs and he says that he and four chums are going from the gold diggings at Araluan and they're walking through the Abercrombie Ranges and two horsemen approach. And when they look up, one horseman's got a double barrel shotgun and the other one opens his coat and he's got four revolvers in his belt. And he says to them, stand up young fella. He said, how many are there of you? And he says four and they all come out of the bush. He says, turn out your pockets. And they've only got a few shillings and a bit of copper. And he looks, he says, is that all? And they go, yeah, we haven't got very much. And he said, okay. So they get off their horses and they go over to them. And they go, he said, pull out your swags. And they pull out their swags. And when they pull out their swags, they've only got a few crumbs of damper and some tea. And he says, is this it? And they're going, yeah. And he just like turns around and he says, Jack, you better go and get some food for these young fellas. And Jack gets back on his horse and canters off into the darkness. A few moments later, he comes back with a sugar bag full of food. And it's got bread and meat and sugar and tea and all the things a young bushman would fight, savour on a cold and windy night. And these young fellows are making up their meal. And these women, horsemen, sit down with them and have a chat. And he says to them, me and my mate here are on the roads. But at the moment, we're keeping it pretty quiet. But I'm Frank Christie, and he said, have a good look at me, because you said you'll see me around, and you hear my name, and there'll be other names used as well. But he said, we're in desperate need of some money, and you guys don't have any at all. So we'll do you no harm. But in the morning, if you want some breakfast, there's a property about 10 miles from here, and it's owned by the Smiths. Now, Mr. Smith, I believe he's in Parliament or something like that, and he's in Sydney. Now, his daughter runs the place when he's not there, and she's a shrewd and a feisty young lass. So ask her for breakfast. And she will say no, but he said, you tell her, Frank Christie bailed you up last night, and I guarantee you'll get something to eat. So the next morning, these four young fellows trundle down to the property, and they see this young lady, and she looks pretty obviously Miss Smith. And one of the workers actually refer to her as Miss Smith. So they think, yep, got the right lady. They wander up to her, and as they're approaching her, she turns and says, who are you? What do you want? And they said, we come for breakfast. And she said, you won't be getting any breakfast here. And one of the young fellows says, well, I think you will give us breakfast when we tell you what we've got. And what happened to us last night, we were bailed up by Frank Christie. And she ushers him inside. She says to one of the servants, get these young lads some breakfast and describe him to me. And he describes Frank Christie to a, to a T. And she goes over to the hall stand, pulls out the police gazette. Now, that's what the old squatters used to do. They used to get the police gazette because they used to want to know who was around and what they were doing in their district. So if they saw this described person, they knew that they were dealing with an ex-convict like Frank Christie. And she reads it out that Frank Christie had been sent to Karkor district after being released from Cockatoo Island for stealing horses. And she reads the description, she says, that's Frank Christie. She said, describe the other man. And he said, I think his name was Jack. And he describes her, this other fella. And she said, that's John Peasley. Because if she grew up in the Abercrombie Ranges, John Peasley grew up in the Abercrombie Ranges, they knew each other. Now this young fellow will say that after that, he goes off, the gang splits up, and gold is discovered at Lambing Flat. And he goes back to the gold diggings at Lambing Flat, and he recognises a man who's then known as Frank Gardner. And he sees him quite often around the diggings. So that places these guys somewhere between January of 1860, when Gardner gets released from prison, and June of 1860, when gold's discovered at Lambing Flat. They're discovered inside that six months. So... You remember that Kuma Ma robbery? That was in May of 1860. So maybe the police magistrate in naming Gardner at the Kuma Ma robbery was right on the money. The magistrate at uh, Karkor has issued out a warrant for Frank Christie, Frank Gardner, arrest. Robbery at Ma Kuma Mail and absent from Karkor. And he sends a Sergeant Middleton and a Constable Halsey down to Fish River to William Fogg's place to arrest Gardner. And remember that Frank Gardner told the magistrate that he knew William Fogg. So Middleton and Housey arrived there in July and they Middleton's about 60 yards in front of Housey. Housey stayed back to put the slip rails back up. And as he's approaching the house, a Mrs. Fogg comes out and she recognizes Middleton and Housey because they were there about two weeks earlier. But these guys are in uniform, but not 
police issue ponchos or police issue hats, they had cabbage tree hats on. But she still recognises them and she gathers her children up and Mr Fogg and they go past Middleton as he goes bolting into the house. Now he sees the calico curtain still moving and he approaches, lifts the curtain up and as he does, two shots come up. And he reels back, phew, and thinks to himself, oh, I'm a lucky boy to be alive. Sticks his revolver back under there again, fires two shots, but at the same time, another two shots come out, one hitting him in the hand, shattering his left hand, the other one passing through the lower part of his jaw, breaking, taking a piece off his jaw and a couple of teeth. So he goes, boom, straight on the ground. Housey has gone around the back of the house. He thought there might have been a back door or window, but there wasn't. And as he's coming back around the front, he sees a man in the window duck down. So he knows there's someone in the house still. He goes around to the door and he goes to approach. And as he does, he fires. He sees this person move. He fires. A shot comes back and Housey gets hit in the temple and he also goes down. Now, he'll testify later that it wasn't Gardner that shot him. It was his own round ricocheting off the door frame and it came back and hit him in the head. But he's down, boom, he's out. Now, Gardner was out of ammunition, so he grabs a barrel of his revolver, and using it as a hammer, he goes to beat his way out. Now, he, Middleton's now drawn his stock whip, and he's using his stock whip to fend off Gardner, and they're making their way towards the front door, when Housey comes round, and he goes up behind Gardner and grabs him by his arms, and they're wrestling around, finally to get Gardner on the ground, and as they're rolling around, they manage, over a period of time, to get their handcuffs on him, they shackle him. So they finally got their man, but Middles in a really bad way. So he says to Fogg, do you have a horse? We want to take Gardner back to Bigger. And he says, no, I don't have a suitable horse. So Middleton says, well, Housey, you stay here. I'm going back to Bigger to get help. Housey's not really happy about this because he thinks that Middleton dies along the road. He panics a bit. In the meantime, a neighbour has come over across the Lachlan and he must have heard the shooting and the shouting and according to Housey, he commandeers his horse and takes Gardner back to Bigger. And on the way, he is stopped by a man who he recognises as John Peasley and says, Peasley says to him while he's covering him with a rifle, let him go. And he's got no option but let Gardner go. Now, Peasley will testify to his dying days that he was not there when Gardner was rescued. The other story that goes around is that Middleton takes off. Everything's consistent up to then and Housey starts to feel a bit, bit sick. So he says to Fogg, can you cover Gardner? And while he's doing that, Gardner takes off. So Housey's forced to chase him. And remember, Gardner's got these shackles on, and a fight breaks out, and Gardner gets the upper hand, and Housey gives in. and says, I give in. You can go free. Bugger off. I don't care. And Gardner, Gardner says, well, I'll give you 50 pounds as a reward or a gift for letting me go. Kind of sounds make sense, but not really. The other story is, the neighbour comes across. He's got a horse. And he, somebody, fog, somebody says, let's shoot Housey. So somebody's got a revolver. And Gardner said, no, no, don't do that. He said, I'll give you five pounds if you let me go. And uh, Housey says, no. And they up it, double it, 10, 20, 40. Eventually they agree on 50 pounds. So the neighbour that's come across the Lachlan, he goes around the district, takes him over two hours to raise it 50 pounds. But he's short two pounds. So they make it up in a cheque, two pounds and a few shillings. And they give it to Housey. And Housey says, yeah, I'm happy to do this, but I want the neighbour to go up the road and he said, I want you to go through the whole thing about rescuing Gardner. So he's made this story up and they actually acted out as a bit of a scam to help Housey justify his ends. Now, Fogg and the neighbour will be so adamant about the truth of this that they will say to the police and the government, if you find out who cashed that cheque, you will find out who was that man. The police and the government never do do that. They take the option just to sack Housey, who goes on to become a gold miner. Now, it's important to cover that story because it is such a varied story and such an important story for Peasley, who is hanged for being part of this, for Gardner, who, shooting at two policemen, is now a capital offence and will be hanged when they catch him, and for Fogg, who is caught up in a bribery charge against a policeman. But we do not hear anything about Frank Gardner for months. He disappears. He says in his own words, he goes and stays at a young lady's place who helps look after him. And my bet, it might be Kitty Brown. And the first time that we know that Frank Gardner, 
John Gilbert and John O'Malley commit a crime together is in March of 1862, seven months after the shooting of, at Fogg's Hut. And that's the first time in the papers we can find that. In April of 1862, John Peasley is hanged. Now, Frank Garden knows that if he gets caught, he's going to hang as well for shooting at those two policemen. So he is given no option but to get out of the country. And the planning for the biggest gold robbery in Australian history is now well and truly underway. Gardner and Gilbert, while planning uh, this escort robbery, are going to take to the roads and become highwaymen. And the first one they hold up, remember, is Hewitt and Horsington. They're still 1,700 pounds for these poor gentlemen. But in the process of doing so, they've taken along a John McGuinness. Now, McGuinness will accidentally discharge his revolver and be banished from the gang. See you later, mate. Now, they also use some local lads by the name of Foley, their brothers, and they were born in the Fish River area and they got pretty good knowledge of the area. And if John Peasley was the first Australian born bushranger, these guys are probably the second. And they'll go on and have a history of bushranging all by their lonesome. But in the meantime, they give Gardner, Gilman, and O'Malley a hand to rob the road between Lambing Flat and Carra. Now, if you're wondering if John Peasley is there, he's definitely not. He actually shot a guy by the name of William Benyon at Bigger in the previous December. And he is on the run. And he's down near Tarkata somewhere where he gets caught once, escapes. But then the police at Wanton Badgery will catch up with him and they deliver him to the Gundagai Circuit Court. And you remember our story about Captain Moonlight? Well, he was caught at Wanton Badgery as well. Now, William Pottinger is this police superintendent at Lambing Flat. And that is where they were going to rob the escort robbery from originally. But when uh, Pottinger gets wind of this potential robbery, he puts extra police on the escort. So Gardner and Gilbert, in their planning, are left with no option, but they turn their attention to the north. And there's an escort that runs from Forbes to Orange, and that goes past Escort Rock. So they're going to need the knowledge and the support of the locals in the area. Now, when they were out duffing and buying cattle in the Western Districts, they got to know Ben Hall and John McGuire at Sandy Creek. And it just so happens that John McGuire's place is where most of the planning for this robbery has actually ta will take place. So Hall and McGuire know about this. Just next to them, the neighbours are Browns and the Walshes at Wago Hill. Young Johnny, Johnny Warrigal Walsh gets to know about it as well. Part of the planning is also done out of the Mallee Shanty. Now we know where that is. And Alex Fordyce works at Mallee Shanty, as does um, John O'Malley, and it's owned by Paddy O'Malley. So they know about this robbery or the planning of it as well. Now, not far away is Wentworth Station. Now, young John Bower works at Wentworth Station. Got a bit of a liking for the grog, has young John Bower. And he goes to O'Malley Shanty as well. And he must get to know about it, this planning of the robbery. So Frank Gardner, his charismatic way of talking to people and being with people, is going to call upon these young fellas to give him a hand. But who turns up? We'll find out when we get there.